Proverbs. Welcome also. We're continuing in what God is speaking to us through the Minor Prophets, and tonight we'll be finishing the book of Amos. So if you have your Bible, Amos chapter 9, we're going to continue in that chapter. But like we saw last week, we saw this pivotal moment when God is now telling them, we're no longer going to be warning you. In fact, what's going to happen, there won't be a famine of food or any of these types of things, but the word of God, as he warns them, no longer are you going to hear about this or that. There's going to be a famine of the word of God to which the Israelites will continue to be deceived by false teachers and also these false prophets. No longer will they hear the truth anymore. And it's really sad, like we see today, these churches that have these apostolic kind of people that say they are apostles like the 13 apostles. They claim to be apostles like Paul, like Peter, like John. Oh no, I'm an apostle like them. And they teach like this according to the word of God. God told me I'm an apostle like Peter. That is nuts. But we see this kind of doctrine that is very untruthly. And the amazing thing is like then we see a famine of the word of God of today in America from things like this. And like last week I gave that example of that German guy who believed because because the church in Germany told him the Jews were dogs. They were worthless. And so this guy answered for war crimes, hearing that they were nothing, killing Jews as this German actually was the one that made the railroads to the concentration camps. And because he heard false teaching at that time in Germany, which predicated everywhere, Bonhoeffer warned against it. They didn't listen. And he believed, dying as he told the minister, saying, you need to repent. You need Christ. And he said, I have nothing to apologize for. I have nothing to repent of. And he died believing that. And so when we're false heretical teaching, it affects other people. And so with the famine there in Israel, it affected them. And we we see it today how it affects people as it goes about hurting them and rightfully so you guys know what happened to May 14th 1948 right that was the day Israel became a nation again do you know what the UN just said they said that was a day of disaster that they should not be a nation that's disgusting it's terrible but this is the current politics, and we look at Israel knowing that's our timepiece. As things continue to heat up, we watch carefully knowing Jesus is coming back soon. This evil that is happening against God's people, what does God tell us to do? Pray for the peace of Israel. That's what he says for us to do. And then you see these guys in the UN saying the day of disasters when Israel became a nation again. Oh man, these people better be careful when they stand before God. And so this all ties into my message as we see the judgment of Israel through Amos. Also, God will talk about the restoration in the end time of Israel. So it's all relevant to what we're going to be studying tonight. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you again as we are able to draw near you to receive from your word, Lord. At this time, Lord, let us be filled, Lord, and washed and ready to receive what it is you have for us. Open our eyes and our ears to the things that you have for us. Whatever is in us that is unpure, Lord, remove it, Lord. Whatever is going on in our hearts at this moment, Lord, let it be set aside to receive the very truth of life, Father, from you. And we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, beginning Amos chapter 9, verse 1, he begins, I saw the Lord standing by the altar, and he said, Strike the doorposts that the threshold may shake and break them on the heads of them all. I will slay the last of them with the sword. He who flees from them shall get away, and he who escapes from them shall not be delivered. They shall not get away, as the scripture says. So right there in that first verse, what I want to focus on in the very first part, it says, I saw the Lord standing by the altar, meaning as the judgment went on, that God was there with them. God was standing there by the altar as the judgment of what's going to happen come by the Assyrians. God's there. And it's amazing that the God that we serve has a loving heart. David Guzik, who I want to quote, says Amos wanted Israel to know that God wasn't detached from even his hard work of judgment. 
Meaning God didn't separate himself completely from the judgment to which they received because he cares for his people still. That's just the love and mercy of God of who he is. Regardless of what they were going through and a well-deserved judgment at that because of how corrupt they came, he was still there present. And it's amazing that our God is such of that, which we know the God we serve, God does not desire the death of the wicked, but that they would repent and turn to him that they may live. As the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 23, it says, do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live. That is the very heart of God that those who do evil would turn and receive life from him and stop doing what they're doing, repent and have life, that he would not have to destroy them. God's original intention for hell was angels and demons. It wasn't for man, but because of their rejection of God and Christ, there is a place there for them. And there are those who seek evil and continue to do corrupt things that we find evil in this world, and it's like, how do these people get away with it? Well, one day they will seek judgment for it, child molesters and the whole lot, I mean, to which God has forgiven us also. But there's those who continue in evil to which they will answer for it. You, you know, we think it's amazing. How do these people get away with this stuff? Well, they won't. They'll stand before an awesome judgment of God, but that's not God's desire is for them to perish, that they would have eternal life. But people make their choice. So the time for Israel here, the pleading is over. Though God stands with them, he never detached completely. The judgment is going to happen for sure. Assyrians will come and judge his people. There's no more chances, famine of the word and truth. No more understanding what God had continued to warn them about. I'll put it this way. When my dad was in the Navy, he told me this story about a guy he worked with who he warned. Whenever you do these things, you have to make it right. And there was a guy that was under his command because he was a chief, so he was leadership. They call him the, basically the enlisted officers, kind of the, what they called the chief. But this guy, they were in, uh, I think, the, during the Gulf War, so they were in the Middle East. And this guy went out to a bar, and he ended up getting into a fight into which he knocked someone out completely cold that he shouldn't have, I guess someone of importance. And so it made big waves. My dad had to come down there and had to do all this stuff. And he told him, all you have to do is apologize and this will go away. This guy said, I'm not apologizing for nothing. Woke up the next day, you need to say sorry. You need to make this right. The guy refused to. The guy ended up becoming dishonorably discharged out of the military. But the thing is, after that happened and he was told that, the first thing he does is he went to my dad. You've got to help me. You've got to get me out of this. And he said, what did I say to you? Apologize to the people. I guess he knocked out some officer or some kind of policeman in, in that country doing something like that. And at that point, when they had told him you're dishonorably discharged, my dad says, there's nothing I can do to help you. And it came to a part where Amos is saying, through God, though I'm standing there, there's nothing we can do to turn this around. The judgment to which you will receive is inevitable. Now, looking at verses 2 and 4, he says, Though they dig into hell, from there my hand shall take them. Though they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. And through they hide, even though they hide themselves on top of Carmel, from there I will search and take them through. They hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea. From there I will command the serpent, and it shall bite them. And so the first part of the verse is it says, though they dig into hell from there my hand. And as it says in verse 1, it says it strikes the doorpost. And so right there, that's one of the strongest places of a house. And God is saying that he is going to destroy that completely. Whatever they can do to hide or to seek refuge will be taken down. People, whenever in California there's an earthquake, what do they tell you? Go to the doorframe. 
go to the doorpost. It's usually one of the strongest spots in the house. And after the earthquake, hopefully that sturdy part of the frame there in a doorway will sustain you. God is saying there will be no refuge, regardless of how strong you think it is, it will be wiped out. And there Amos uses that illustration of a doorpost, something strong that was able to withstand destruction. Not so for them. They will be inevitable for them to continue to seek judgment. Whatever they could do will be futile. They can climb to the highest point in Mount Carmel, as it said, or Mar Mount Carmel. They will be able to go to that point. It doesn't matter. Wherever they think they can get too high or too low, God will find them, as he tells them. And we know with sin, it has to be paid. But God follows them through their eyes. As it says in verse 4, Though they go into captivity before their enemies, from there I will command the sword, and it shall slay them. I will set my eyes on them for the harm and not for good. Regardless, God sees everything. And for us and what we hide or whatever is dark or deep in our hearts, God knows. God sees. There's no fooling that. I love what Leonard Ravenhill said. He said, you may fool your friends, you may fool your family, you may even fool your pastor, but you will never fool God. And that's true. Forever, who wants to put on a facade and think we're fooling people in our fellowship or our pastor and our family? God knows everything about our heart. And for the Israelites, to those when that destruction came, believe me, they wanted to hide. They wanted to get away, crawl into some kind of hole. But God said there will be nowhere for you to hide. Every single one of you will be found and be judged. And rightfully so, like it says in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 3, I'll read it here. It says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. <clears throat> Doesn't matter. God sees all things. But rightfully so, what ended up happening with the Israelites there in the north, one of the main things that they had become so corrupt about is that mainly when people devise evil, they do it at night. People have meetings, secret meetings at night, and then in the day, they let them out. Well, according to Micah, chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Woe to those who devise iniquity and work out evil in their beds. At morning light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. And specifically, he's talking about the leadership of Israel. It got so corrupt to something you think it, what they did would be at night. No, they got so corrupt they would practice it in the daylight. Meaning, it's midday. Here they are in the court system taking whatever they want from people. There was no devise at night anymore daylight here we are whatever you have I'm gonna take because they had become so greedy they stole from the people taking their properties and homes and making orphans out of the children of Israel which God despised all in broad daylight there was no longer a hiding or any kind of care of sin or feeling any kind of remorse for what they did every day they propagated in broad daylight the evil and the wickedness in their hearts and this is why God says, I see all these things, and these will die by the sword. It's coming. Verse 5, and he says, The Lord God of hosts, he who touches the earth, and it melts, and all who dwell there mourn. All of it shall swell like the river, and subside like the river of Egypt. He who builds his lairs in the sky and has founded his strata in the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. So what right here is Amos is doing, illustrating the power of God showing them, remembering that they had become so corrupt that they thought nothing would ever happen to them. These people were so delusional that they thought God would never touch them or send any kind of judgment their way. And because of this, God is painting, or Amos is painting, a miraculous picture of God's power, that they would see exactly what God is going to do, what he's capable of, that would put fear in them. This is the God of Israel. There's nowhere they can go and hide. But what's amazing is the wickedness of their heart to think nothing would ever happen to them. And we meet many people like that in our lives today. But what's amazing about our gracious God is that's like it says in 2 Peter 
chapter 7, verses 8 and 9, when he talks about why he delays his coming. He delays his coming so that those who are wicked in this world would come to know salvation through Jesus Christ. So many people say, where is your God that you serve today? Where's this Christ that you keep talking about? Where is he? He's withholding because of you. Because of that very statement you make, he withholds his wrath of God so that you may know the grace of God if you are willing to repent. How many people do you know saying, God is so slacking? Where's this God? You know, you have people, do you serve this mighty God? Where is he? Don't worry. What you need to worry about is getting to know Christ so that when he does come, you're not in the wrath of God in that time of Jacob's trouble in those last days. You don't want to be there. Letting them know the love of God. It's so miraculous and amazing who he is. But for Israel, Amos is painting this amazing picture of the power of God that they need to realize, wake up. But even in that, hearing of what God's capable of, their hearts are so hardened, their necks are so stiff, meaning that if they were to turn, their heads would just fall off because that's how hardened they had become. They wouldn't want to turn to hear truth or anything like that. They were just so focused, hell-bent on destruction, immorality, and idol worship. Then he says here in verses 7 and 8, Are you not like the people of Ethiopia to me, O children of Israel? Says the Lord, Did I not bring up Israel from the land of Egypt? The Philistines from Kaphor, Kaphtor and the Syrians from Kerr. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are on the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Yet I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord. Amazing. So first off, he mentions these kingdoms because he's saying, are you like them? Meaning these other ones God has already dealt with. That's why we don't see Edomites or any other kind of ites in the world. We don't see these people today. They have been completely destroyed, as God had said. We went through detail in the book of Jeremiah, each kingdom, from the Edomites to all of them, how they had all been taken out prophetically. It's all happened. You don't see them walking down the street. And when you're in Israel, you don't run into any of them. <laughs> you're not going to be surprised having one or meeting one. It's not going to happen because it has exactly happened. And God said, are you like like them. Well, in a way they were, because their face was the face of every immoral nation around them but God. See, the Israelites represented every other Canaanite God but the God himself, Yahweh, because they stopped serving the true God to serve everything else in their life. Remember, what we allow in our life affects us. What we begin to serve and portray in our life will have an effect on our lives. So when we allow things in our life, we're not going to reflect Yahweh. We're going to reflect whatever that we're so into the world. It has an effect. Israel not realizing being deceived by their lust and greed for things and idolatry worship became twisted into something else, no longer resembling the plan God had for them to represent Yahweh. They looked like every other nation. God is like, are you like them? And there from there, he says he will destroy it, but he will not utterly destroy it. God still has a plan for them. There will be a remnant. There will be a remnant in the last days, and we're going to go over that, so we'll continue that later in this chapter. Now, verses 9 and 10, he says, For surely I will command and will sift the house Israel among all nations, as grain is sifted in a sea in a sieve, yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, who say the calamity shall not overtake, nor confront us. And so right there, what he's talking about is all the false teachers. To those who continue to propagate that this isn't going to happen, don't worry, God's not going to judge us for our idolatrous worship. He will destroy them. They will be dealt with. Those who prophesize lies. And you got to understand, these false teachers are like that. Amos, he's crazy. 
What crazy Amos sitting here speaking about how we're going to be carried off and be destroyed and the Assyrians are coming. Don't listen to him. Even till the last moment till the Assyrians arrive, these fools are out there prophesying that somehow God's judgment is not going to come upon us. Can you imagine when the judgment came upon them? All these people believing the lies when they witnessed it? Sad. But what's amazing <clears throat> and all these things is it's prophetic because after that judgment, the Israelites went all over the nations. Russia, Turkey, all these places that they have been to Europe, America. And what's amazing in fulfillment of prophecy, they all return back from all these places of the world. May 14th, 1948, God restored Israel. Now, are they completely restored? No, there's going to be a complete restoration of Israel, as we know, in the prophetic end times. But the fact that God fulfilled prophecy that his nation would be a nation again is incredible. They were sifted out, as he said, through this judgment, they'd be sifted out all over the world, which they were, and then came together again. May 14th, 1948. Amazing. Now, looking here, verse 11 through 15, he says, Israel on that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does this thing. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the traders of grapes, him who sow seed. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their land, and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Amen. There will be a mighty restoration of that day, which is still to come, which is prophesied, which we can trust, knowing already that God has restored Israel and the fact that they came back to a nation again. It's amazing. The prophet Zechariah speaks of that very thing. So please hold your place there in Amos and let's turn to Zechariah chapter 8. It's not too far. We're going to be looking at verses 4 through 8. We can look at this fulfilled prophecy. Right, Zechariah chapter 8, beginning at verse 4, he says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Old men, old women, shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each one with his staff in his hand, because of great age. The streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls, playing in its streets. Thus says the Lord of hosts, If it is marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days, will it also be marvelous in my eyes, says the Lord of hosts? Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. I will bring them back and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Praise God. And so right there, when we go to Israel and we are able to be in the town of Jerusalem and you see the kids and we saw for ourselves little kids there running through the streets there in the old city. It was just amazing to witness prophecy being fulfilled, seeing the laughter of the children playing, you know, and it was really cool. And, and you know, when you go to Israel, it changes your life. You get to see God's hand at work. The Bible is true till this day and it is trustworthy. And what's amazing is someone like Charles Spurgeon, here's Spurgeon, who was well before the restoration of Israel or the prophecy fulfilled of the people coming back to the land. You know, he was in the 1800s, 
the land, this prophecy gets fulfilled in 1948, and this is what he has to say. It's prophetic. It's amazing. He says, The hour is approaching when the tribes shall go up from their own country. When Judah, so long ball, a bawling wilderness, shall once more blossom like a rose, I think we do not attach a sufficient importance of the restoration of the Jews. We do not think enough about it. We certainly don't. If there is anything promised in the Bible, it is this that the Jews would return to the land. And here's a guy in the 1800s believing in faith God would bring his people back home. It's incredible. He says if there's anything else in the Bible we should attach to is this, this very prophecy. It's amazing that a guy who had faith and taught the word of Scripture believed God would fulfill his promise in bringing his people back to the land. Praise God. How amazing is that? To which they will be... Whew, Restored, and it will be even greater restoration in Jerusalem. It will be that epicenter in that millennial kingdom as they are completely restored. God restores Israel. He restores Jerusalem to this new heavens and new earth as we will see and we will live there in, in this millennial kingdom for a thousand years. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be incredible to see this. And I always tell people, go to Israel now. Go if you can, but, you know, it doesn't matter if you can't go now because you'll see it one day. You know, you'll see this amazing work in which God has done in that day as he completely restores his people in the end times. It's just amazing. God's not done with them. They will realize who the true Messiah is in the last days. After being deceived, like it says also in Zechariah, that they will realize the people in my house who crucified me, speaking of his own people who sent him to the cross, they will realize in my house who their Messiah was. It's just another prophecy spoken in Zechariah. So as we live in the time, we know it's short, believing every step God is with us. As God has fulfilled his promises, we know we can have faith in trusting him. Amos is that great picture as we see the restoration of his Israel, as God continues to restore and work in us and change who we are. Now, in closing, remember, Amos was nobody important, as he said himself. Amos was just a sheep herder. This guy was a farmer. I picked fruit. I tended the figs. This guy did nothing miraculous in his life, but he was faithful in everything that he did. That's why God chose a guy who did the least job in society that anybody would care about. If you were a shepherd or any kind of sheep herder, you were not of anything important. But what God sees is the heart, and that's what really matters. So we, as God's people, not people out there, big time tycoons and, or head of banks or anything like that, people living day-to-day -day lives in a community, we are the hands and feet of the Lord. We just have to be faithful continuously, and God will use you. We don't have to be anything so special in this society that they go, oh, man, you are something. No, we're nothing. But it's the power of God in us. As Amos was called, so are we to represent the wonderful Lord because God looks at the heart. Everything else the world looks at, prestige, money, position, God looks nothing at that but the heart of the man. And because of that, he uses anything. And just as the word of God says, he can use a jackass, a donkey, someone who's stubborn, who just fights against everything, but he can change the hardest of hearts to be used to turn the world upside down. And we know that because Peter was one of the hardest cases of a person that acted before he thought. <laughs> And many times, that's so much of our heart and our mind. We speak before we're supposed to. We act before we're supposed to. We are diligent enough to stop and think before we act. But because of God, he can turn that around and make us into him in image. And he can use us because of being faithful to him. So it's just an awesome study in the book of Amos and what God has said. We are looking forward to the restoration of Israel. Looking forward to the end times and Christ coming back. Let's just be found in him, not in the world, serving the Lord. Will he find faith when he comes back, as Jesus said? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord for this awesome study in the book of Amos, Lord, believing on every word that was spoken prophetically, Lord. Continue to move in our hearts, Lord. Let us remember these things. Let us not forget them so quickly. 
Though we aren't anything mighty in the world's eyes, Lord, we are mighty in you because we have the Holy Spirit, Lord, and what you would say we do far even greater things than you ever did, Lord, as Jesus said. And we thank you, Lord, that we can be your hands and feet, Lord. Let us be faithful in what we do in our day-to-day -day lives, seeking after you. We thank you for these things, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.